ecological systems at the same time. So um, I'm going to go through um, a few studies that I, I was lucky to get involved with um, that all of them have the objective to, to try to understand a little better that dose response curve between 0G and 1G um, using ground analogs. So this is one first study uh, that um, I did at MIT with uh, Dr. Larry Young. Uh, so this is the MIT centrifuge, and the idea was to replicate the um, AGRI project that Dr. Iwasa was talking before um, a few days ago. So we had subjects on a centrifuge. The centrifuge was limited to 1.4 meter radios to mimic the space available that we would have had in the, in the ISS. And uh, we also added an exercise device and we tested multiple gravity levels and multiple exercise intensities, and we measure um, different things. Among other things, we measure cardiovascular responses. So the gravity levels that we measure um, was zero G or no rotation. So now we are talking about the, um, the head to toe direction. So we could imagine if you don't rotate, you have zero G in the head to toe direction. That was sort of our control. Uh, 1G at the feet, uh, that was about 28 RPMs, and 1.4 Gs at the feet, uh, that was about um, 33 or 34 RPM. So, let's see. This is a video of this, uh, what the, the study looked like. We have a subject over there. This is um, creating 1.4 Gs at the feet. So this is how, was, um, how fast was rotating. Um, All right, so um, I'm, I'm going to show some of the results, and, and the main result here was that um, the data suggests that AG combined with exercise is actually beneficial. You can see in the, um, in the left, these are responses for cardiac output. So we conducted a 25-minute protocol, and at the very beginning of the protocol, we had subjects to, we got some baseline over here just lying on the centrifuge. Then we have a um, um, moment, this, this PINA process that we spoon up the subjects up to the desired G level. And then they, they went and, and did this exercise protocol, and they did three different phase, three different exercise intensities over there. So you can see that uh, the green line, which corresponds to 1.4 Gs at the feet, the highest G level, is on top of the blue line, which is on top of the red line. So we had an effect um, on cardiac output, among other things. Um, based on the gravitational, um, the gravitational force that we were putting in there. Um, so that was a good result. This is the same data, I just plotted it in a different way, um, and you can see some statistical differences that we were able to find. But uh, more interestingly, we can start creating these dose response curves that I said before, and, and continuing with the, the example of the cardiac output over here, you can see in the y-axis the cardiac output, and in the x-axis we have this gravity level. Um, the experimental data are the points that you can see here. And then we fitted um, hierarchical regression models to that data. So we are starting to have a sense of what's happening between 0G and 1G. So we are not claiming this is what's actually happening. We just have the data that we have. Uh, but this is what we can start to, to predict and get more insights into what, what the data is going to look like in between those values. Another caveat for this experiment is that um, this is valid um, in this specific configuration for this specific study. And this is particularly important when we are thinking about uh, short radio centrifugation. We have so many variables that can be different, starting by the um, gravitational gradient. You can have the same g-force at the feet, but a different gravitational gradient if you put the subject in a different configuration. And you can play with the radius, you can play with the uh, gravitational, excuse me, the, the velo rotational velocity position of the subject. So those things um, are important to keep in mind when we, we try to extrapolate data from, um, from what we got. Um, we also have, I put a, as an example, pulse, pulse, uh, pulse pressure, but we have a lot of other variables that, that we were measuring. So um, another thing we like to do is to model things. Um, we think models are really important, and uh, models can give a lot of additional insights into the actual physiological mechanisms of what's happening. 
And more importantly, models can also predict uh, what's going to happen in situations where maybe taking experimental data is really difficult or it's impossible or it's really expensive. Um, so, so that's an area that we are also interested a lot. And uh, for this specific work, we took a lamp parameter model. It's a model that is based on uh, resistors and capacitors. It's a very engineered model. And um, these, these parameters are based on the physical characteristics of the different parts of the body. So we got this model developed originally by Thomas Held, and we implemented the idea that we have a gravity gradient, so centrifugation on a short rate of centrifuge, and also we included some mechanisms related to exercise, for example, the muscle pump effects, uh, increasing abdominal pressure, like certain uh, physiological responses that we know happen when we do exercise. So we implemented everything in here, and we recreated the exact same protocol that we did experimentally. Um, so these are some of the results, and the way to deal with these, these models, um, these models have a lot of parameters, like our model has a lot of, like more than 100 parameters. So the, the way typically we validate these models um, is, is the following way. We get a couple of parameters that we tune to the data, so these are considered inputs to the model. Um, and then we run the model, and then we see what happens in another set of parameters that is different, and we took that as an output to the simulation. The, this is very common in, in models that are um, hyper, there is a lot of, of, of parameters in there, multi-parameter models. So in the top, you can see the, the variables that we talk, that we took for, um, to, to tweak the model as inputs to the simulation. So we really tweak a couple of parameters. We didn't need to tweak a, a lot of them, just a couple to, to mimic the responses um, of mean blood pressure and total peripheral resistance. I forgot to mention, the, hopefully you can see this in the screen, the, um, the light gray um, uh, shadow that you can see here, that's the experimental data plus minus one standard deviation. And then the dark line, that's, what, that's the modeling response. So you can see that the modeling response really fit really well uh, the experimental data. And then if we look at the outputs, these, these, these are a couple of examples. We were really able to predict heart rate really, really well. Uh, cardiac output um, also really well. We underestimate a little bit cardiac output, especially at higher um, workload levels. But still, all the data was able to, to stick within one uh, standard deviation over there. So, so keep, keeping um, a little bit with, with the modeling aspects, um, you know, so someone can argue, well, you have a model with a lot of parameters, and those parameters are the resistance of, of the venous compartment in my legs, the, the resistance of the arterial compartment in, in my head. So all these parameters have been estimated from the literature the best we could. Uh, and it's actually a really hard task because we, you know, getting data from humans is harder than from animals. So, so someone can argue, well, you have a lot of uncertainty in your model, you have all these parameters, and you can't really tell if those parameters are representative of your population. So the next step that we are doing is like, okay, well, let's just do um, really comprehensive sensitivity analysis and say, well, maybe there are some parameters that I don't have them really accurately, but maybe I don't really care because they really don't affect at all my responses out there. However, if those parameters are gonna affect the output of the model a lot, these are parameters that we really need to, to take care of and we really need to be careful when we choose them. So, uh, so that's the next step, but this is work that is ongoing. Um, I'm not going into the details. We are using a Latin hypercube sampling technique. Um, to, to really cover all the parameters, and we are getting um, results uh, in, in this form. This is one of the results that we can get. This is um, the parameters. These are representing parameters of different compartments of the body, and this is a specific factor that, that you get out of your study that basically is saying the higher this factor, the, the more effects in the output of your model you have. So basically we are seeing like we have three, three compartments that are basically driving the response of, of the, the model. So these parameters, we really care a lot. The other parameters, we care a little less. And actually, if you are curious, this uh, parameter, um, let me see if I can see. Uh, 
Um, it's, it represents the, the Venus uh, compartment of the splenic compartment, and that, that makes sense because this is where we have a lot of blood stored typically. Um, another one that is very important is the leg compartment. Again, it's a big compartment, and also in this specific configuration is, is the compartment that is the farthest away from the center of rotation of the centrifuge. So that, that means the gravity level in that compartment is higher, and that also makes sense that those parameters are important, specifically for this particular um, centrifugation modeling that we are, we are trying to do. So this work is ongoing, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll get something out there soon about this. Um, and then everything we have been talking about or studying so far has been looking at acute responses, like really fast acute responses to orthostatic stress. So we looked at centrifugation for 25 minutes, and let's see what happens. Uh, we want to go a little further now and go into this idea of what's going to happen when instead of 25 minutes, you are going to be um, you know, for a year or even three years in space. So, so we are trying to attack this problem of predicting cardiovascular responses uh, during long duration exposure to microgravity, but more broadly, hypogravity. So we are going to attack the problem using three different um, mechanisms. We want to use, um, uh, we want to create the more comprehensive cardiovascular data set that ever existed. Um, so there is a lot of data out there um, that we can get from Skylab, from MIR, from the ISS. Uh, so we are going to try to collect that data and try to look at the data a little bit differently. Um, instead of using the traditional statistical way, we have been looking at the data so far, trying to use you know, the novel machine learning techniques and things like that to see if we can, we can get something out of that. Uh, so that's one aspect. The second aspect is about the modeling that you saw before. Uh, the model only has um, short-term control feedback loops and things like that. So we want to expand that and, and start to add a little bit of longer feedback loops that we know um, happens when we are um, when you are exposed to high progravity environments. So leading with aldosterone and blood volume changes and things like that. And, and then finally, we want to we want to use experiments to validate um, the model and our predictions. So we want to use um, short radius centrifugation. We want to use head up tilt, head down tilt paradigms. That I'll, I'll mention this in a second in the next slide. And hopefully, we'll get access also to to the new one year missions. And, and we are getting a really nice data from from the one year mission. So hopefully, we can have access to that. I also want to say this work is being led by um, uh, Rich Whittle, who is here in the audience. He's a PhD student in the lab. Um, so he's the one leading this, this work. And he has, if you have more questions about this, he has a poster on, on this. So, so you guys can ask him um, if you have questions. Uh, all right, so uh, let's move on to this other study. Uh, this time looking at a different ground platform. This is the head down tilt, head up tilt paradigm. We have been using minus six degree tilts uh, to mimic microgravity for a long time. That's a very well accepted analog. Uh, but also what if instead of um, you sustain that, we use different tilt angles to represent different hypogravity levels. There is one specific angle where the gravitational vector head to toe direction is gonna mimic what the gravity of Mars, and the same with the moon. So we conducted a very similar study, exercise study, um, than the centipede study, but we used um, this platform and we model, uh, we, the, the conditions included the Earth configuration, which is upright, uh, Mars, moon configurations, and then microgravity as well. Um, so these are the kind of results that we, are, uh, that we got. In this case, it's heart rate. Um, and you can see it's very similar. This one was like a 27 protocol, uh, but the same way subjects did a, a baseline. The baseline in this case was taken seated. Uh, then there is a transition period where subjects were getting out of the seat and going to the platform and, and strap them in, in the different configurations. Um, and then the exercise study where they were doing exercise um, at different intensities. Um, 
So this is an example that we were getting things correctly. Um, this line over here corresponds to the upright position, and we expect the heart rate to be a little higher if you're in an upright position. So we were able to see that, and that gives us, com give us confidence in the kind of data that we were getting. The same way we can put this same data, uh, the same data in a different way. Um, so micro, moon, Mars, Earth, and then the three different bars corresponds to the three different exercise intensities. So we can start again seeing these dose response curves between 0G and 1G, this time using this analog paradigm. Um, always important to keep in mind, but, but again, we are starting to fill the, the gap between those values that we, we didn't have any data before. Um, okay, um, and again, uh, these are some of the variables that we collected. Uh, we focus on cardiopulmonary responses this time. So we have um, O2 and CO2 and, and other things. So we are starting to, to get some, some idea of how that hypogravity environment um, works. All right, and then finally, this is something that is ongoing and in collaboration with uh, Professor Lonnie Peterson from San Diego. Um, and, and we wanted to look at um, SANS a little bit, and, and I think we had some um, presentations about this before. Uh, we think this is related to the fluid shifts that astronauts get in microgravity. We still don't understand very well what's going on, but uh, definitely IOP or interocular pressure is one of the variables that, that, that seems to be interesting to look at and, and might affect might be important in this, in this mechanism. So we decided to test the effects of IOP, sorry, the, the effects of changing the gravitational vector on IOP. So we took, um, th this is a data set of six subjects taken at Texas A&M, and we tilted them uh, all over 360 degrees um, and took some IOP data um, during this whole like 360 degrees. Um, so this is what the data looks like. Um, over here, this is the data upright, and subjects have data, IOP is between 10 and 20, which is more or less what we expect to have in, in an upright position. And then the more we tilt people down, either head down or head up in prone and supine position, uh, that IOP is, is going up. Um, so we are, we are characterizing changes of IOP when we change that gravitational vector. And then, really, really interestingly, we took a computational model that is not ours, that's a, a computational model that was published recently, a couple of years ago, by the NASA Glenn folks. Um, and it's a very similar model, lamp parameter model, but this time modeling um, all these mechanisms related to SANS. So we took their model and we plotted our data on top of it, and actually it all fits really, really nicely. They validated the model with tilt data, but the data didn't cover the 360 degrees. Um, so, so we are really excited about this and um, more results coming soon, uh, working on it. Um, and then finally, if I have three more minutes, I, um, I just wanna talk very quickly about a vestibular study that I was also lucky to, to be part of. And that was also done at MIT with uh, Professor Larry Young. And here, the idea was to try to understand roll tilt perception in hypogravity environments. Uh, it has been well established that people overestimate roll tilts in hypergravity environments. So the, the obvious hypothesis is that while well, we of underestimate roll tilts in hypogravity environments. So we came up with this, um, this paradigm of a centrifuge. Uh, so we have a subject sitting on a centrifuge in a supine position, so we have the uh, G level going down, and on top of that, the subject was rotating, so we were creating a centrifugal force in the head-to-toe direction. And once they were rotating, we did an additional rotation uh, of the chair, such as the subject was being tilted. Uh, under a centrifugal force that could be less than one. So this is how we came up with, with a way of measuring hypogravity um, on Earth. Uh, all right. So this is what the, the testing looked like. On the left is the, the eccentric rotator that is located at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary in Boston. And on the right, you can see this was in the test, testing phases, so we just have a mannequin there. But hopefully you can appreciate it's tilting a little bit the head. 
And we were asking the subjects, tell me what your tilt is, using a um, subjective vertical task that is pretty typical in this kind of testing. And uh, to summarize the results very, very quickly, we actually saw this was the first systematic study uh, experimental evidence that we underestimate um, tilt, roll tilt in hypergravity environments, uh, hypogravity environments, I'm sorry. And not only that, but um, we underestimate gravity, but if we provide visual feedback to the subjects, those subjects are able to, to come back to the original performance after having visual feedback too. So just to summarize, um, this idea, we have a lot of ground analog uh, ways to, to study gravity changes, not only hypogravity, but also hypergravity. And I want to take the opportunity to say that Texas A&M is getting a human rated centrifuge. Some of you are familiar with the centrifuge. It was located at UTMB in Galveston, and it has been in, in boxes for a few years, but um, we are we are getting it at Texas A&M. We are building a building, literally, to put the, the, um, the centrifuge. It's, it will be closed. Oh, it, we are extending our clinical facility. So we, have, we will have the opportunity to do bed rest studies. We have a pharmacy. We have labs. We have a lot of exercise equipment. So we could potentially host bed rest studies in the future as well. And if any of you is interested in, in collaborating in centrifugation research, um, you are welcome to, to, to come and, and do that as well. Other analogs that we can use, I talked about lab platforms, definitely parabolic flights, uh, partial gravity treadmills, and bed rest studies that um, everyone is familiar with. Uh, with it, as this, I want to wrap up, say thank you to all the subjects and operators, mentors and colleagues that have been um, supporting these projects, one or more of these projects, and definitely the students that um, are now taking over and, and doing the hard work for, for all that. So with this, thank you very much. And happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll have to defer questions until the uh, until the break at the end of the session. I'm afraid. Uh, try to stay partially on schedule. Our next speaker is uh, Ilya Golko from Ohio State University, <clears throat> speaking on small-scale experimental artificial gravity space station in Earth orbit. Hello everyone and thank you for sticking around until the end of this conference. A lot has been said, like Professor Diaz noted, about the artificial gravity and its importance, so I won't go much into detail about this. But I would like to take us on a small trip and think like an engineer uh, how to approach the design of an artificial gravity space station in Earth orbit that would actually be realistic to achieve in the next 10 years. A little bit about myself, my name is Ilya Gulko. I'm a student at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering, and I'm currently pursuing master's in aerospace engineering and will be graduating next year. In addition, I'm working at the non-equilibrium thermodynamics lab, where we study high-speed chemically reacting flows. Think about hypersonic flight. The air is heated up so much that it starts to chemically react with itself. And this is the kind of environments that we study. To put a couple of pictures to the work that we do, here we see a glowing plasma generated between two copper electrodes by applying a high voltage. And the plasma is sustained inside of a low pressure flow of pure nitrogen gas. <coughs> here are a few parts that I designed for a non-equilibrium supersonic wind tunnel where we can simulate the conditions of hypersonic flight in a laboratory room. And lastly, here's a snapshot from a publication that we made. Uh, we basically placed a small cylindrical model inside of a supersonic flow and compared the shock standard distance in a chemically reacting flow versus non-chemically reacting. This image was obtained with Schlieren photography. The top half shows the non-chemically reacting flow, the bottom half shows chemically reacting flow, and we see that there is a slight difference noted. But of course today I'm talking about something else and something that is very important to the goal of Asgardia of paving the road to living in space. Of course, artificial gravity is among the most essential technologies to achieve this purpose, to make this dream a reality. 
However, we are yet to see a functional human-scale prototype of an artificial gravity space station in Earth's orbit. So why is that? The primary reason for this has been a specific interest from the scientific community in the microgravity environment, in addition to some technical challenges of implementing the AG, uh, such as was discussed on the first day, uh, docking a module to the International Space Station could risk the structural integrity of the entire station. This partially translates to the high cost of building such technology in space, contributed both by the launch costs and by developing the new technology necessary to implement this. However, this didn't mean that the idea of an artificial gravity space station left the uh, human minds. On the top left, we see uh, the station from Stanley Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey movie. The bottom left shows a conceptual design by NASA from the 1950s. In the center, of course, is the Stanford Taurus, a concept of a multi-kilometer radius station which will house an entire city inside of its circumference. And on the bottom right, is actually a more recent concept designed by a startup, the Gateway Foundation, that plans to fund the station partially with scientific research funds and partially with commercial funds, uh, basically making a part of the station into a five-star hotel. So what is the motivation behind this work? It is a big step to go from the International Space Station to a completely different design a different scale, so we do need some intermittent step that will let us go from there to here. This approach will be a more low-cost solution that will give us a platform to conduct basic design studies as well as research in artificial gravity conditions in space. For this design, we desire as few launches as possible to minimize the launch costs and to use as many readily available methods of construction to minimize the, uh, the amount of new technology that we need to develop. Before this, let's remind ourselves briefly of the fundamental formulas that guide the design of such stations. On Earth, we can characterize the gravity by a singular number, which is the acceleration of free fall. Like we all know, it equals to 9.81 meters per second squared, and this value varies ever so slightly depending on where on the planet you are. However, fundamentally, it is a function of Earth's mass, as well as the observer's height above surface. Of course, assuming the observer is much, has much less mass than Earth, such as a small satellite in orbit. In the conditions of artificial gravity, which is generated in the centrifuge, uh, this value is replaced by the centripetal acceleration. And the easiest way to think about it is imagining yourself holding a bucket full of water, giving it a spin, and in the end, the water stays inside of the bucket. This is the same effect that we're using to generate artificial gravity. In this case, it will be dependent on the angular speed in RPM and the station radius. Keeping this formula in mind, let's cover some phenomena that are perceived specifically inside of a centrifugal uh, artificial gravity space station. And let's just plot the constant gravity lines uh, to help us define the design space for the station later on. The first phenomenon that we observe is the gravity gradient. Of course, humans are approximately two meters high. That means that our head is about two meters closer to the center of rotation than our feet are. So the head experiences less gravity. So let's uh, add the constant gravity gradient lines to our plot. The second phenomenon that we see occurs uh, is related to tangential velocity. Imagine a human inside of a huge centrifuge moving along the circumference against the direction of rotation or along the rotation. This will, of course, alter the tangential velocity, which contributes to a different perceived level of gravity. So now let's add these lines to our plot. Lastly, the Coriolis effect. But in the context of a large radius spinning centrifuge, these forces will be relatively small. So let's leave them out of this discussion for now. Looking back at the image, let's uh, introduce some design constraints to really narrow down our design space for the station. First of all, let's say we want a smaller station of radius less than 80 meters. So let's 
paint out red anything on this diagram that is outside of that limit. We want the small gravity gradient, the small difference between the gravity on the head and the legs, let's say less than 5% difference. Let's add this to our plot. We want to create a gravity between approximately half Earth's gravity and the full Earth's gravity. So again, let's write out the regions outside of this boundary. And lastly, we want a high tangential velocity to minimize the difference in gravity if the astronauts are moving along the circumference. Let's pick a value arbitrarily over 20 meters per second. Finally, looking back at the diagram, we end up with a small space in the center, colored in white, which is our design space for the station, which basically means we can select any pair of the angular speed values and the station radius that will intersect in this region and take these as the key design parameters for the station. So let's think about the proposed design and let's take ourselves to the Earth's orbit where the station will be located. This is a brief design that I came up with based on these constraints. It is comprised by two modules. Below we see the habitat module in yellow, which will provide the operational base and living quarters for the astronauts. The service module in the top in pink, which houses all the life support systems. The two modules are held together by a set of structural cables shown in black that can be reeled in or out using the spools painted green. The two modules are connected by an umbilical harness, which gives a conduit for water, electricity, air, and any other communications necessary between the two modules. The umbilical harness can also be hided inside of the umbilical spool. Initially, when we send the modules into orbit, they will be docked using the docking ports shown in gray. And together, they will form a single rigid structure Next, the cables will be connected, and when the astronauts arrive to run the experiments, they will arrive in the crew capsule. Whenever they're ready to initiate the gravitational spin, the thrusters on both the crew capsule and the habitat module will be used to give it a slight spin. And at the same time as we're starting to spin up the station, the cables are getting unspooled. Simultaneously, we're increasing the diameter of station's rotation, as well as the angular velocity until we're at a point where we are generating a full Earth's gravity. This point comes when the station is between 1,800 meters in diameter and rotates at a speed of five rotations per minute. This puts us at a spot right in the bottom of our design space, which would allow us to minimize the radius of the station. To summarize, this station will take only two rocket launches to put itself into orbit. And since there's not much new technology besides the cable spools and the cable system, uh, this station can be constructed using the facilities already available at the ISS, using the crew and using the manipulators on board. And at this point, I would like to conclude with a quote by Nikolai Zhukovsky. Uh, he said it in 1898, the man will fly not with the power of his muscles, but with the power of his mind. And I believe that if we change how we think about anything, we can change the world. Thank you. Well, sounds like we got a time for a question. Yes, please. I just had one simple, more or less simple question. Um, in terms of um, emergency, you know, emergency services, like for example, if something happened within the spool design mm -hmm. or with the umbilical harness, um, what systems you might have you might have built in for that. Right. So if I just try to come back to the sketch of the station. Well, 
The habitat module actually has six degree of freedom thrusters which allow it to position itself. I'm assuming that there will be some emergency system if one cable were to break or a spool were to jam. There will be an emergency separation system which will allow the habitat module with the astronauts to separate from the rest of the station and then using the thrusters stabilize itself in space. And of course there will be multiple redundancies in the habitat module. Do we have more time? No, afraid not. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Thank you. Okay, so I will apologize in advance for what I, how I'm about to murder the next title and speaker's name. Uh, Lightus 1 2, a universal spaceship design concept by Kristen Zosch. Close enough? Thank you very much for inviting me to that Congress and to giving me the chance to share some design ideas with you. Um, so I'm going to um, present you the Lydis One spaceship design concept. Um, so in contrast to the currently existing um, spaceship or, or spaceship crafts that we are using, um, which are mainly focused to have a space transport um, under a microgravity environment, um, the the LIDIS-1, or uh, living disk concept, considers fully the presence of a given or an, ex an artificially uh, generated gravity. Um, so you might now think, okay, the, the presence of a gravity makes things maybe more complicated within a spaceship, but the opposite is the truth. Um, so if you, if you involve gravity um, in the process on board on a spaceship, many things can be designed much easier. Um, for that reason, um, the spaceship itself had, has been designed to work in two di gravity directions, so the given and an artificial one. Um, but this concept goes much further. Um, so on uh, one hand side, um, it provides a very uh, variable usable um, spaceship hull um, and life support components that can be used in uh, low Earth orbit, in far distant regions, um, but also in a landed state on an asteroid, moon, or, or planet. On the other hand side, um, it is able to generate artificial gravity um, um, no, uh, second, um, the concept reduces massively um, the complexity of all its components um, in order to increase the lifetime um, to a maximum and to reduce, to reduce uh, the, the risk of malfunctionality, of malfunctions. And this becomes more important the far distance um, a space travel will be. Um, so in the later presentation, I will give you some examples of the simplifications um, that were intended for that spaceship. So the basis um, for the construction um, is a pressurized spaceship hull in a disk shape, having a diameter of 10 meters and having an average um, 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 height of three meters. If you imagine this in a landed state, um, facing its flat side downwards on a, on a celestial body, um, passengers will be able to walk on the lower side of this disk, um, which is then very uh, useful um, if a mission wants to plan, uh, plans to land on a, um, on a celestial body um, where you have to, um, where you need a, a habitable um, um, habit, uh, no, <laughs> where, you, where you need a, a habitat to live for a longer time. On the other hand side, um, if this disk is in space, it can rotate about its central axis and can so generate some, um, some artificial gravity. Um, and so a spaceship designer finally only needs to consider um, that uh, the masses around this central uh, rotation axis is equally distributed. And this is, what that, uh, this is what has been done in the first step of the design of the spaceship. So um, the first step was to integrate, um, just let me point. Um, does it work? No. No? No. This one? The high top. Top? Oh, yes, I know. 
Yeah, so the first um, design step was to integrate here an inner ring wall that increased the centrifugal walking area um, by an inner um, low gravity area. A second step was to divide um, the outer corridor into, six, uh, into eight segments, like a pizza, um, of which six segments were designed to be uh, planting segments. Um, the segment in the front um, became um, a living room or a laboratory, if you like, um, and the segment in the aft um, interacts as an airlock or as an um, uh, interconnection segment between the co two corridors. Um, the inner ring corridor is mainly domi uh, dominated by two um, uh, 450 liter um, bioreactor fuel cell units um, and two biogas tanks. Um, and only the, the front area in that inner corridor um, uh, provides space for navigation room um, in which, like a cockpit, you can um, check the, the status of the ship and can control everything um, yeah, in, like you do in a cockpit normally. Um, just check. Um, along the outer spaceship wall, um, four um, engine pods are located. Um, so these engines, for example, could be um, rocket engines, conventional ones. Um, it could be also um, um, ionic thrusters, so depending on uh, the force you need um, on your trip. Um, so these are exemplarily uh, engine pods you can replace by any um, um, propulsion that you like. Um, the advantage of this um, um, decentral uh, propulsion is on the one hand side um, that you can generate with these four engines a, a force of 1G um, that provides to the inner um, also artificial, artificial gravity. And on the other side, if you turn these um, engines by 90 degrees, you can also control the rotation of the spaceship. Um, let us now turn um, to some components of that spaceship in detail. So first of all, um, I would like to show you here the plantings. Um, so the plantings occur in six um, of these planting racks. Um, they are mounted in front of the inner ring wall um, and they can be rotated. So depending on the gravity direction that at the moment occurs, they can um, either be used in this vertical orientation or they can swing out um, to this radial configuration where in a rotation phase um, you can use them as well. Inside each rack, the plantings occur in within six planting boxes and on the side of these boxes, um, planting channels are mounted. And inside these planting channels, a nutrition solution is circulated that is um, also delivered from gravity from the top and is also um, without any pumps or anything like that, um, is, is um, flowing down through all these channels to the, to the bottom where it's then again drained um, and um, brought back to the circle. Um, the illumination is between these uh, boxes, so the plants can grow upwards um, inside um, in this um, growing area, having an ideal uh, light configuration in any position they grow. So overall, um, this space, uh, concept spaceship um, provides 1,024 meters of this planting channel um, that um, contains 438 liters of nutrient solution. A second example um, are these um, bioreactor fuel cell units. Um, so um, as said at the beginning, so they have each a, vol a volume of 450 liters. And at the lower end of these units, a fuel cell is working within a liquid bath. Um, so this liquid is then refilled by the, by the water produced by the uh, fuel cell and is also heated by this fuel cell. <coughs> then out of this, water steam is evaporating and rises up along here this fermenter body and heats so up that they are in contained biomass, which is necessary for the fermentation finally. Um, at the upper end, um, the water steam is then condensed 
um, cooled down by uh, airstream that is provided by the, by the airstream circulation in the ship. And so finally, this unit also provides um, next to nutrient solution, electricity and water also uh, heat to all the spaceship areas. Um, this unit can also be rotated so um, that depending on the gravity that you are currently um, have, um, that all these flows that I mentioned can occur in a, in a direct way. Okay. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, so uh, there were no no much pumps integrated, but of course there is the need to to pump liquids, um, which is mainly the nutrient solution. Um, so uh, here the decision was made because we need only a very low flow rate for this um, solution um, to use an Archimedean screw pump that is uh, conveying here the nutrient solution from the lower surface of the, the outer um, corridor to the inner surface ring where it is then distributed again to the, to the planting racks by gravity. The specialty for this is um, that here the bearings um, are made with this float inside that is floating um, on the top of this water level in combination with permanent magnets. So the, the bearing itself is contact free and does not need any lubricant. And for this reason, um, this is a perfect solution for a long term mission um, where you need a pumping function for a very, very long time. Finally, I also want to tell you something about the hull itself. Um, so besides um, the 25 centimeter thick um, thermal isolation, um, the radiation shielding is uh, mainly done first by the outer um, ship hull with four millimeters of alumina and the inner ship hull with uh, 1.2 uh, millimeters of alumina. Then inside um, applied to the thermal insulation, you have also a laminate made of metal foil and, and graphite enriched resin and also other um, possibilities we heard um, that also um, um, reduces the incoming radiation, but what is very special, of course, is here um, the hull cavity. So this inner and outer planking of the hull um, can be used first for, for uh, flow, um, in one case with air that equalizes the different hull temperature that could occur, for example, if sun is coming in and on the other side is very cool, so you have to equalize this temperature in order to, to reduce the, 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 the forces on the spaceship hull. But this can be done also with water. And in that case, um, if you fill up this hull with water, you can upgrade the functionality of this spaceship flexibly, and you will have then finally a 10 centimeter thick water shielding around the whole living area. So ideally, this water filling can be done after start, or when you, when you have been landed on a planet or a, a target object um, that will protect you in addition. And, and I think 10 centimeters might be able to reduce this uh, incoming radiation by 50% or so. Um, so coming to the end, um, I don't want to bore you with, with many figures. Um, maybe one thing, so um, currently this, um, this data behind, um, of course, was already reviewed with single um, topic-related publications that I was able to find. Um, I also made my, my own experiments to, to verify this data I, I published. Um, it seems, um, because the, the initial calculation was made for one exemplary person, um, but it seems, because you have um, also here this um, fuel cell running, which is really a beast in, in uh, oxygen com consumption, um, and also here this bioreactor that needs a lot, uh, that produces a lot of CO2. And for this two, uh, to feed these two, um, um, two uh, components, you need a lot of biomass. And having that uh, turnover implemented in the ship, uh, it should be able, I think, also to supply a second person with that configuration, only that you have to change um, the, the, the composition of the plants that you um, plant on board. So that would finally uh, end my, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, our next presentation is Space Colony Swarm Architecture by Jacob Mulder. I won't come up. <laughs> I will come up in another way. Do you need the remote? Or will yeah, a remote would be fine, yes. Thank you. Takes a while to come up. Okay, well, um, very good. My name is ja Jacob Mulder, um, uh, and I'm an architect. That is to say, I'm an IT architect. Um, I work for a large uh, international uh, IT company called CGI, uh, with some 80,000 people all over the world. And I've got my own small uh, uh, private uh, consultancy uh, uh, organization called MAD, MAD Melange. Um, and um, I want to talk to you about architecture. And architecture is a bit strange thing, maybe, um, but we do need that when we have to go to space. When we want to go to space, we want to create a habitat, uh, but before we can create a habitat to live in, we need all kinds of services that will support it, like uh, security services, manufacturing services, all that kind of services we need. And the nice thing is, eh, on the one hand, you need an architecture to create all the services and to make them together. On the other hand, all those services also provide an opportunity to make money because you can make a service-oriented architecture. You can create the services, you can create logistics as a service in a commercial way, and that way you can make money. Yeah? So it's, it's a good idea to have all those services, and at the end, when you've got all those services, you get the habitat services, then you can finally go up there and emigrate to space. That's the idea. Okay, but first, before you can get an, an architecture, you have to st uh, start somewhere. What is your mindset? What do you want to do? Why are we doing this? We're doing this for science, no, not really. Of course, science is important, but we're doing it for people, for us. We want to go there, so we have to do this, and Asgardia has the, the good mindset for that, in the sense that we have a holistic approach. We look at things at all kinds of sides, which is very good, and then we can make a total solution, a total architecture for the whole uh, habitat service, and the habitat that we are going to build over there. Uh, most important thing is we start with uh, safety, robustness. And of course, it has to be sustainable. We, we want to live there, we want to remain there, at least. Uh, not all of us want to remain there forever, but we want to remain there huh, a, a sustainable way, self-supporting way. And I a good idea is always to mimic nature, not mimic it in every way. We don't want to mimic the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Big Bang, of course. That's a bit too much. We have to do it in an evolutionary way. Um, so and in a collaborative way, internationally. Okay, the global solution, before I come to all those different uh, services, global solution is that we should have a collaborative network, a network where all kinds of things collaborate. Uh, like, for example, not one habitat, but a number of habitats, and support from not only the Earth, but also from the Moon and all kinds of other celestial bodies, and a space armada, like, for example, the nice thing that we just saw, huh, the disk, that kind of things. We need all kinds of extra uh, space devices, things floating in space, to help us. Because we need uh, manufacturing areas, we need energy supply areas, we need all kinds of things working together, and a protective swarm and a logistics fleet. I'll come back to those things. That's the global solution. It's a complete architecture. A lot of things together. But first, the first thing that you need is security services, because you want to stay alive, and you want to keep in one, one piece uh, over there. So, um, and there's rocks floating around and debris floating around, so you have to protect against that. So what you have to do is have a sort of a swarm to provide a defense against that, pulling away those rocks and other stuff that comes by, and when things do come by, they will hurt your spaceship or so, they will create some, some, some uh, uh, hole or whatever, then you have to repair things. The, the thing that we just saw could, for example, help in that, but uh, preferably you need uh, robots or so for that, uh, for that autonomous repair. That's much more sustainable, much more nice to do that. 
And of course, once inside of those uh, 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 habitats, you need, of course, the sustainable environment services and yeah? everything that we already saw the last few days. Uh, and of course, I'm an ICT architect and I'm a security architect. You also need information security. It is also important when you start building things to things together in information. Anyway, so once you've got that safety in place, then you start manufacturing. You can uh, start making stuff uh, on Earth, but making it in space is usually much, much easier because you don't have the gravity, make use of that, and build things over there. Uh, pull things into space with a magnetic uh, 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 slingshot device, whatever, eh? come up with some smart things. Uh, you are smart people, we can come up with uh, nice things, like, for example, this, 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 uh, 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 now well, I'll come back to the next slide. But we can 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 get a, a manufacturing complex in space and combine things, uh, manufacturing things over there. Uh, we also need logistics to get from here to there. We need to launch, land and to uh, uh, launch and so on. We could use, for example, the the laser guided uh, uh, propulsion that was uh, presented uh, yesterday. I think it was. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do with uh, propulsion. Uh, and uh, uh, I have a poster that explains more information that, that w I can explain now. Uh, I also need Venus for that, uh, but I won't explain now how it's done. But what we have to do is uh, things like services, and we should do something like taxi in space. Why, why not uh, Uber in space? Yeah? It's all commercial. You can uh, do that, that kind of services in space. Why not? Yeah? Always think a bit out of the box. Uh, that way we can make it sustainable, because we can make it uh, more commercial. Uh, we also need a lot of energy. That's always what happens if you talk about uh, things in space. You need a, a lot of energy. When you've got really abundant energy, then you can do much more. So what do we need? Lots of solar panels, lots of whatever. Huh? We need our great friend, because that's, that's the thing that all of our energy comes from. Um, there's m more ways of getting energy, but this, this is the, 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 the thing that we should use a lot, our sun. Yeah? And we stu should store energy, not only in, uh, in batteries, but why not? We're in space, have a large mass, rotate it, and store the energy in the rotation of this large mass. Uh, and when you slow it down, you get the energy out again. That kind of things, uh, out of the box. Um, uh, this is where Asgardia is, is at best, the cohesion. We have to, have to keep everything together, not only physically, but we have to keep communicating. We have to keep uh, 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 using standards, standard components, standard units, standard uh, language in how we communicate things. Not, not that we have to speak English, all of us, but we have to standardize things. Um, and um, uh, of course, uh, uh, use some coordination for things and so on. And the sharing of the knowledge. And most of us are scientists. Uh, a lot of knowledge will come out of there. We have to share that knowledge, not in reinvent the wheel. That's very important, because we're so large, we have to do that. Uh, energy has to be balanced, for example. Huh? That's also something that you have to have the coherence uh, for. OK. Once you have got all those things together, all those services as a prerequisite for, for this, then you can start thinking about creating a habitat. Yeah? A habitat, and not one, but you have to have multiple ones, yeah? because the will be uh, many uh, created, and uh, there will be developments all over the place with a thick wall. And because we have learned that this radiation is really a thing, we have to really, uh, 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 um, uh, how you say that, um, um, uh, protect ourselves from the radiation. And one of the ways to do that is very with a very thick skin. And to be able to create a very thick skin, you need a quite a large thing. Otherwise, it, it's not, not useful. So if you have a, a, a cylinder capsule of like four or 500 meters long and 160 meters diameter or so, then it's at least a reasonable size. Uh, and then you can put a 1,000 people in there, for example. Uh, I've got a picture on the next slide on that. But that's not the only thing we need. We need multiple of those things, because once in a while, something will happen. Accidents will happen. Uh, disasters will happen. And then we have to flee to another part. Yeah? So we need multiple settlements. And uh, to be able to do that in a, uh, in a, in a uh, uh, sustainable way, we need to use standardization, standard blocks, standard things, uh, standard connections, and so on, because that way uh, we can build much faster and we can reuse stuff. Um, 
it might look something like this. This is just, as, just an idea. The other one was much, much, much more better, of course. But this is the idea. This is a cylinder with uh, half spheres at the end with an axis, some spokes, and uh, the thick wall uh, around it. And there's, a, uh, uh, there's a, a docking at the end, which is a sort of a harbor, uh, which you, you can flee inside or you can flee outside, or normally dock, of course, and in a Star Trek way, why not? Uh, let's, let's create nice things together. Um, Anyway, when you've got all these things together, then we can really go outside. Then we can really go to, to space. And I myself really want to go to space. Uh, I really want to emigrate to space, and that is beca because I am gravitationally challenged. Um, I studied astronomy, uh, um, so I know a bit about uh, gravity and so on, but I, uh, I'm in this wheelchair because I've got problem with gravity. I can stand up a bit, but my, my spine gets squeezed by gravity, so I want to lie down like this. And my situation is, is getting worse. Uh, the expectation is in, in 15 years or so, I have to lie down permanently, which is very frustrating. You don't want to do that. I've been doing that for two years, a few years ago. That's really bad. Yeah? So uh, I want to get rid of gravity, really, myself. Uh, so I have to go to space in 15 years from now. The alternative is that I have to lie down for the rest of my life. And I don't want to do that, so I will go to space. And you will go to help me with that. Yeah? <laughs> Use me as a guinea pig. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm quite serious. I mean, I, mean um, I have to. Yeah, that's clear. And there's more people like me, of course, but uh, I, I did study astronomy and I know, know things about IT and so on, so I can be uh, of, of uh, assistance uh, out there. I can do uh, good stuff. And um, uh, hey, I've got my own private co consultancy company. It's called MAD. Huh? That's not for, for it's clear now. Huh? Um, but uh, I also work at CGI, which is really a large company, really, really large multinational. And they have the power to implement. There's more companies like that, but we need those large multinationals, international multinationals, to create these things. Yeah? So we have to give them some, some uh, uh, good uh, business model, some good b business opportunities, some lead or so, so that they, they can go with us. I'm not a commercial guy, but uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm an architect, but we really need uh, organizations like that into Asgardia. And my, my own MED is already in Asgardia, and I want to get CGI also in Asgardia. Uh, this, is, this is the important part. The, the, our phrase is a thing. We have to do everything uh, as a whole, as a humanity. Anyway, almost my last slide. Uh, more, more information is on here, on, on my poster, which is you, you already saw, I, I guess. And of course, I'm a resident, so you can, we can talk uh, on uh, via our uh, forum, of course. And of course, I can also be uh, 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 connected via the normal human, normal Earth-like style. We have websites and mail and everything. Yeah, so uh, I'm, of course, in the registry of Asgardia, and I'm at CGI, and I'm in the Netherlands. Okay, so please contact me. Please use me as a guinea pig uh, for all your experiments or whatever. And please help me to get rid of my gravity. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course, if there's questions. One I question. No, it was all clear. <laughs> Very good. You know where to find me. Okay, so we, we better have it scheduled by about a minute. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> okay, the last talk for this session is Space Colony, uh, uh, sorry, Expansion for the UN Moon Agreement. The speaker is Rudolf Miner. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored that I can close this uh, three-day session with something a bit outside of what you have heard up to now. It's outside not only in scope, but I think it's also outside a bit in time because the idea for this, what I'm going to say, is 
I think about 20 years old. 20 years ago, we set up a foundation, the Push Foundation, Peaceful Uses of Space for All Humanity. Let's see, where does it, oh yeah. The idea, I just finished my normal uh, paid work and I started to do unpaid work as an uh, pensionado. I wanted to use my knowledge, my network and all that, not just throw it away. And at that time we thought, how come that we have been 30 years, nothing happened in space? I mean, we have been on the moon, fantastic, was a high point for humanity and then nothing really happened. I mean, of course there were some commercial satellites and all that was a little, effort afterwards with um, <coughs> Skylab and things. But uh, is there a way that we can accelerate, new, give a new impulse to humanity, the, uh, all of humanity, especially the United Nations, uh, in order to get going again with the plans which we had since 1970? And how can we, in this endeavor, also involve smaller countries? You know, it's the big 20 who do all the things these days and the other ones can come along with a little experiment or they get a little bit of data, of training. <clears throat> but it's really not a big involvement for them. And then a little different approach was, can we do an international space project like uh, ISS and so on, which was then already uh, being built, something uh, without the very heavy and time-consuming, money-consuming way it's being done by these large organizations. I work myself for ESA, so I know how it's going. You know, you put down a lot of requirements and the industry has to fulfill them and then to change them and then it gives delays and then you have to pay more and all that. Is there a different way we could do that? So that was the, the concern, the uh, questions which we had. What can we do? Well, we looked around and how did the world organize itself in other areas? The one we, which was very uh, acute at that time, and I think still is, is the Spratly Islands or the China's Chinese Sea, where uh, many countries are claiming dirty little rocks because, of course, they know there's something uh, underneath it. So it's not organized. These rocks were never really uh, given to anybody or assigned to anybody. It's still a mess as far as I know. The other areas where there was some regulation was the deep sea mining. Deep sea is outside of the territorial uh, 200 miles of every country. There is an, an agency that's called the International Seabed Agency or Authority and they regulate if you want to go and uh, dig up manganese or other interesting things which are at the bottom of the deep sea. Antarctica, okay, there were some rules made, but and fortunately we don't need them yet because people leave Antarctica alone. It's technical diffi technically difficult to do anything there, but there is a, at least a rule. There is a, an authority, the Antarctic Treaty System, that tells you what to, do, to go about. And finally, the geostationary orbit, you know, is a, a wonderful place, but it's just one line above the equator at uh, 36,000 kilometers. And there we have the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, 600 people working in Geneva, doing nothing but uh, ordering the traffic up there. There are about f 500 satellites, 500 active satellites, and they have to be controlled. They have to make, make sure they are on the go proper position, they send with the proper frequency, they shine to the proper country and all that thing. So that's all very well organized by the United Nations. Then if you look at the moon, which is maybe our next big goal, then uh, they made a moon treaty already long ago, 1984, uh, as a, a 
specialized document to the Outer Space Treaty, and if you read it, it's of course small print, all is about common heritage of mankind. So the United Nations agreed, yes, the moon and the other celestial bodies should be useful, should be for the benefit of all mankind. Nobody can claim it, that's they said clearly, not a single country can claim anything, but the benefits should be for everybody. So the Bush Foundation made two proposals which were then uh, sent to the uh, o o OSA, the Office of Outer Space Affairs in uh, Vienna, and we tried to get it going. One was Moon Miner, which was attacking the problem or was trying to define how we can use the resources which the moon is offering. How can we do it in a, in a just way to the world? And the other one, Lunakov, was a proposal to do something visible, something which people can see, which they can photograph, which they can be proud of. How did these two proposals look like? Moon Miner is actually very simple. You just take the central point, you know the moon always shows the same side, so take the central point and draw 200 lines, 200 sectors. So every country, small or big, just gets a, a little slice of that uh, a, a sector where they have mineral rights. It doesn't mean it's property of them, but if Shell or Esso or somebody wants to go and dig for some gold or mangan or helium-3, at least they know whom they have to address. If they go into the North Sea and want to dig for oil, they know we have to go to England or Norway or whatever to get the license and pay, pay for, uh, for um, the license for digging there. On the moon, we should define this before the gold or oil rush or whatever starts. So this is a simple <coughs> scheme which the UN could do, like they were distributing the geo-orbit. Uh, every country got the spot on the geo-orbit, and even some small islands in the Pacific have a, their own parking spot. And since they don't use it themselves, at least they can get money because somebody else wants to park a satellite. Well, they get a steady money stream just for a parking up, up on the geo-orbit. The other one, the other problem, Lunakov, is Lunar United Nations Circle of Flags. You know how people react, especially governments. If they have the flag somewhere, they feel happy. <coughs> the Americans did it when they went to the moon. The first thing they did, they put the flag there. But we shouldn't possess anything, or the country shouldn't possess anything. So we said, why don't we just send a robot, a robot, not an astronaut, just a robot who goes and puts all these 200 flags in a circle around the, U the UN flag. And that is the proposal we sent to the member states of the UN. We said, if you give us a small contribution, we will organize the party. How, how do you organize such a party? <coughs> um, if you look at it, can you see it? Oh, yeah. So, uh, first, on the left bottom, you have state number X. They pay a certain sum, let's say one million or two million uh, dollars, into an escrow account. That escrow account stays in a bank, escrow, it's not to be spent, and it will be managed then by a foundation. Uh, in, the, in those days, it would have been the Bush Foundation. And they organize an international competition among all the industries. They can propose to implement the mission, to send the robot to put all the flags there, and only after it is implemented, if it is a success, then the exchange of money or funds would uh, then be taken with a venture capitalist. In other words, the, the participants, the individual state has no risk. They just have to put the money there and either they get the flag on the moon, their own flag on the moon, or they get the money back. And the whole story, of course, has to be 
uh, paid by some venture capitalist who gets some nice return on investment. Uh, I'm already at the end of my story because what I really want to do is an old plan. It didn't succeed because people said, oh, Mr. Minder, you're too early. We cannot do it now. You know, we have just a turn of the century. Come back later. Now I come back later. I don't come back to the United Nations. I come back here to Ascardia and say, guys, this might be a nice thing to take over, modify it a bit according to your own wishes, go to OOSA in uh, Vienna, it's very close to Ascardia's office, and talk it over with them, try to launch it again. <coughs> I think it will cost, what I said, in the order of uh, two million per country. With 400 million, you can make a wonderful mission, a robot to this, the flag setting, and of course, every country can play the national anthem with a general or somebody standing in the television and the robot planting his flag. It's a very ceremonial thing. It has no real business uh, aspect, but I think humanity and especially governments and all these dictators and other heads of state would be very happy if they could play that to their people to the tune of two million. I thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, it brings us almost to the end of this uh, two and a half uh, fascinating, amazing days. Um, <clears throat> and so actually, before the closing, I would like to now hand over the prizes, uh, the prizes for the best presentations slash posters. They were given by the uh, uh, science committee with, uh, based on Lucas Sorizo, Jacques Van Loon, uh, Jeremy Sage and Victor De Maria. So, I actually, would like to ask Jeremy and Jack to to come here also on stage as a backup. Uh, to also, um, I did not have anything to do with the choice of the the best presentations slash posters. Uh, so, I will wait till you are together with me on the stage. Thank you, Mr. Minister of Science. So, ladies and uh, well, uh, is it uh, uh, you? You're gonna oh, pause? if. You I can just be the backup. I, I, actually, I like be the, ba the backup, so <laughs> it's perfect. Okay. All right, if, if you don't mind. So, okay, the first, uh, so we have one oral and two posters. And the first poster prize goes to Elin Radstaker for... <laughs> Then the second prize goes to Richard Whittle. And then the third prize goes to Stephen Jillings. Okay, so this is almost uh, the finish, the end of the Congress. Let me just thank briefly the two persons behind the counter there, Thomas Pichel and Stefan Klink, because they made it all happen that we were not too having too much the blue screen of that during the presentations. Uh, very important because that makes it uh, flawless. Uh, and also Dima, I wanted to thank because I did not do that yesterday explicitly. Apart from that, I want to very much from the bottom of my heart Thank you all for being here, for making this possible, because without you, without your, uh, let's say, inspiration and, and uh, empowerment of this, it wouldn't, be have, it wouldn't have been possible to have you and to make it fantastic Congress. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this wasn't planned. I just thought it two seconds ago. But thank you, Flores, for all your organizations you did for this.
So uh, be before you run away, there are still there's coffee and there's drinks, and I think there's even alcoholic drinks for those those who don't have to drive. So you please uh, enjoy these things also as a finishing of the congress.